time. If you've ever had a system that just needed a pound or two every year, that system had a leak. In most cases, that leak will get bigger and bigger over time until the system will no longer operate or will cause major component failure. It is incumbent on the service tech to be vigilant in locating the leak, then repairs or corrective measures should be taken. In some cases, the leak may be as simple as a service valve or service valve caps. That's eight bucks for two new caps to prevent as much as $800 in refrigerant leaks over the course of one year. Now let's review the chart that shows how the EPA will reduce R22 availability. HCFC-22, that's hydrochlorofluorocarbon, that's a big word, um, 22, which is known as refrigerant 22, or as we all know it, R22. This allocation rule was put into place by the EPA. As you can see, this is in millions of pounds. In 2013, 63 million pounds of R22 refrigerant was allowed to be manufactured or imported into the United States. This is, uh, this is based on the Montreal Protocol, which was put in place in 1987. This is how gradual, it was a, a very gradual decline up until about 2013, which is when I started capturing this data. Now, what happened, the EPA saw that this wasn't happening fast enough. So they decided in 2012 that by 2015, there was only gonna be 22 million pounds allotted to the United States. That's why there was a significant drop here. And I put down here in the bottom, this was my median price for refrigerant. In 2013, I was getting about $31 a pound, okay? Conversely, this year, my price was about 70. Average price is about 90. So. My projection for my cost um, early next year is about $90. There'll be 13.2 million pounds of R22 available to all the United States. Um, as you can see in 2018, it goes down to 8.8, 2019, 4.4, 4 and 2020, which was their target, is zero. Um, just last month, they were talking about moving the target to 2018, which is going to make this absolutely ridiculous. As you can see, I've just got lines here because AC experts will be out of the R22 business in 2018. So, um, so now you say, that was a cool chart, Bruce, but how does that affect me? Glad you asked. Um, regulations are gonna increase. It's, it's going to happen. This was found to be um, a horrendous uh, problem with the ozone. Uh, a lot of techs are not reclaiming R22 and sending it back for processing and processing and recycling. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, some good, some bad, but in any event, what's happening more often than not, the stuff's just getting bent into the atmosphere. So the regulations will increase, I can promise you that. Consumers will be responsible for repairs. Um, there's not gonna be a hey, if you still have 22 and want to get rid of it, you know, we'll give you a few hundred dollars. They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. It's, it's going to fall on you. If you have R22 in your system, you're going to be responsible for getting rid of it. Um, supplies will decrease. Demand will increase, which is going to cause the prices to rise and rise <coughs> and rise. And that's, unfortunately, um, there is some gouging going on. Um, I don't approve of it, but it's there. Um, if you ever have a question, or if you have friends or family that have questions about something that's going on with one of their bills, you, you've got my number, give me a call. I will shoot you straight and let you know what's going on. Um, consumers will eventually need to replace equipment or components. That's gonna happen, like I said. It's, it's, it's just a matter of when, not if. Uh, now, you say, what options do we have? Let's see. Start saving your money um, to replace your system if you have an R22 system. This is what I recommend for most of you in here. Um, that's those that I'm familiar with, uh, especially if your system's not causing a lot of problems, you're not having to uh, have a lot of repairs done, you don't have a major component fail, and you don't have a leak, you can run the R22 until 2020. It's not a big deal. Um, and even beyond that, but once you have the leak uh, beyond that, it's, it's got the whole system's got to go. Um, you can replace only the affected components. In a heat pump, that would be the air handler in the attic and the condensing unit outside. The lines, I can uh, run flush through the lines and clean the lines out and remove all residual R22 from the lines before I put the new refrigerant in. Um, 
In the case of a furnace, you'll have a case coil in the attic and the condensing unit. Those, those units can be replaced. Um, you could upgrade now. You can convert your system with drop-in replacement. We're going to talk about that more in just a minute. Um, you can wait until the HCFCs are banned, or you can just roll the dice. <laughs> we'll lock it with so, Before I get into the eight steps, I want to talk to you a little bit um, about drop-in replacements because drop-in re refrigerants um, are not quite what you think. The term was coined in my industry and has caused quite a few problems by technicians that don't truly understand what the term was meant to mean. To be clear, it must be understood that there are no refrigerants on the market that can just be added to R22. You, you can't just drop a, a drop-in refrigerant in on top of R22. Um, then you're, you become a chemist and you really don't want to do that. So um, this has been done by some technicians um, with disastrous results, including very poor system performance, erratic system operation, system refrigerant leaks, and compressor failure. Now the leaks will come um, if the drop-ins aren't put in correctly right away. Uh, R22 swells elastomers, which elastomers are basically rubber. And there are components in the system that have rubber linings or gaskets. When R22 runs over that rubber, it will swell it. If you pull all that out and just put a nice deep vacuum on it and then drop in a new replacement, and you haven't replaced those elastomer seals, they're not going to swell anymore, which means you're going to have instant leaks. And they're going to be small leaks that will turn into very big leaks. So it needs to be done. Uh, in the correct manner. These are the eight steps. You would establish a baseline. Say one of you called me out and your system's running just fine. And uh, you want to see what it's going to take to convert it. And so you can plan for the future on how you're going to do it. So I'd come out and want to make sure your system's viable for the, for the drop-in replacement. Then we'd establish a baseline. In other words, how is the system operating on a day-to-day -day basis in the summer and the winter? Um, in the event that we're going to replace the refrigerant, we would recover the existing R22. We would check the lubricant in bigger systems, some of you that have offices or, or buildings that you manage the bigger equipment, uh, the lubricant would need to be a specific type to accept the drop-in replacement, and if that wasn't the case, then I would change the lubricant. We would replace the filter dryer and the last one parts. This is what I was just talking to you about, and the filter dryer is very important in replacing refrigerant because it needs to be compatible with the new drop-in that you're putting in. We'd leak check and evacuate the system, we would charge the system with the new refrigerant. Then we'd start the system, of course, and check the performance based on the established baseline. And then we would label the system. This is part of the problem right now with technicians not recovering refrigerant. Because if I take what I assume to be R22 back to my vendor to have the refrigerant recovered um, or reclaimed, and then they send me a report back saying that wasn't just 22, somebody had something else in there, then I get to pay for that. So um, a lot of guys right now are just skirting around the issue and venting the stuff to atmosphere. So it's very important that the system get labeled. The pros for the eight steps to uh, refrigerant replacement are, or, or, I'm sorry, the pros for replacing your refrigerant are, it's better for the ozone, of course. You can avoid the R22 shortages. You can avoid the spiking R22 prices. And you can avoid the cost of full system replacement. The cons are it's a loss of efficiency. These, these machines were not designed to operate with this stuff. Um, it's not compatible with all units. I'd have to check to make sure we can even do it. And it is really just a short-term solution. So in closing, I just want to remind everybody to just say no to gas and go. And that's all I have about the fun stuff that is R22. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. How do you know if you have an R22 system? You have me come out and take a look at it. Do I have? You did. <laughs> and your home and your workplace. Perfect. Mm -hmm. What about me? <laughs> <laughs> You've got one of each. What if you bought a brand new gas? Um, like just closed a couple weeks ago. So. That that should definitely be a 14A system, but if you're not sure, I'd be glad to come look at it. About what year would new construction have started to switch over to? Depends property. on the builder. Because <laughs> along about, don't shoot the messenger guys. Yeah. Along about here, I stopped selling dry units or units that had R22. 
that's 2014, but some companies still had access to dry units and our 22 units. Mine doesn't have anything. No, you got four tenants. Yes. You're good. You're a renter. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many hours did it take you to prepare for this presentation? Um, it was just a little something I threw together. Perfect. <laughs> no, it, 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 I, I probably spent about... Did you use a ruler? <laughs> no, that's all premium. <laughs> Even my circle. <laughs> yes, John. Uh, question and testimonial. Do I have large one here? No. Awesome. And um, testimonial for Bruce. Uh, like I said, said this before, but for the new people, um, we had an issue where we had two brand new units put in a couple of years ago, and our bill skyrocketed, our electric bill, and Bruce came out. And the guy who came back, they really, really tried for days and days and days. Why it was so high? Bruce came out in five minutes, dropped my bill, two hundred bucks. So awesome! And I referred him to a bunch of other people. What was the problem? It was where the thermostat was located. On the upstairs. That was it. It was literally. It was in a dead spot. Yeah, he walked in, said, "That should go over here." So it was just running. The next day, it was in a dead spot. Thermostats are designed to pull air across them, so your return should be. Central to the thermostat, it should be it should be to where it can pull air across it. Where his was was at the top of the stairs. It made good sense as far as you know. Well, that's well, a great place for the staff, you know. But mine's right above it. For yeah, mm -hmm. that's and that's that's typically how it is. His was not. His was around the corner. So I relocated his thermostat and then turned his return around where it was actually pulling air from the, the foyer instead of from off the wall. But that that took care of uh, the majority of his problems. Yes, sir. So this R22 system, like it has worked for a long time. Is the new this new stuff that's coming out? Is it does it work better? Is it does it work better, or is it about the same? Like the performance of 410A is probably about five percent less than 22. 22 is a is an awesome refrigerant. Um, I actually had another page before this one that um, apparently only. Kristen's fellow would really enjoy, so I'm saving it to share with him. But um, no, I, when I when I because I I actually practiced this a few times at home, and uh, I had to scrap the first page because it wasn't user friendly. So, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. Yes, ma'am. Um, kind of a random question, but my heater system runs on fuel oil, mm -hmm. and this year I've noticed that even when the thermostat says the temp it's higher than the temperature I set it at, or I actually turn the thermostat off, the heater will continually run. Is okay. my house possessed, or um, should I? No. <laughs> It'll continually run for a few minutes and then stop, is that right? Um, sometimes for quite a while. What it is, is there's a, that's heating up a chamber on the inside, there's a sensor that's attached to that chamber. So when you stop throwing fire into that, and this, this is typical with a gas furnace as well, when you stop throwing fire into that heating chamber, uh, and it's called a heat exchanger, that thing gets cherry red. When you stop throwing fire into that, um, it's still really hot. Uh -huh. So the, the blower will stay on to continue to blow air across okay. that until it cools down to the point where it's safe, and then the blower will cut off. Okay, so it's not in It's not possessed. Okay. <laughs> Frank, I'm gonna cut you off. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 